Because as these bailout agreements have been finalized, there's been some controversy about which industries and which people deserve to be saved by the taxpayer. Joining us right now is Ken Feinberg of uh, Kenneth Feinberg Law Offices and the former administrator, of course, of the 9-11 Compensation Fund. Ken, it's great to see you. Um, one of the big questions that this entire pandemic and the response has created, and you've seen it play out on the air right here on CNBC, is this idea that we have effectively socialized the losses and privatize the gains all over again. And uh, everybody wants to get this economy moving as fast as humanly possible, but there are going to be winners and losers picked along the way. How should it be done? That's democracy. I mean, you ask the Congress uh, in consultation with the executive branch, they decide the priorities. What's very, very important in all of these programs I've learned over the years is uh, there's got to be bipartisanship. If anybody feels that the program is polarizing politically, uh, it, it's hampered. And I think uh, what's happened here with such a huge bailout package is an attempt by both sides to come together, work out a common blueprint, and then implement that blueprint. All the talk in the world about how great uh, the government is in responding to this crisis pales if you don't get the money out, you don't get it out fat, fast, and people have to see the results. That's the key. Well, let me, let me ask you this, though. And, and, and Chamath Palihapitiya was on, on uh, CNBC last week talking about this very issue. In the case of the airlines, for example, the goal, of course, is to say airlines are critical to our U.S. economy. You want to keep the employees um, employed and on the payroll. But at the same time, in, in the way these bailouts are structured, they're also protecting the shareholders. And the question is, What's critical about airline shareholders relative to any other shareholder, to a shareholder or a sole proprietor of a restaurant who may ultimately go bankrupt? Why should the shareholder of the airline, for example, um, be a beneficiary relative to somebody else? I think the answer is fairly straightforward. There's a, a prevailing view in Washington that the airlines, unlike another company or another industry um, um, group of companies. It is the airlines that are a critical part of this. I think what's happened is Congress has concluded that it is vital to keep the airline industry at least solid uh, for the future of the country. And I think, you know, people can take issue with that implicit in your question. But at the end of the day, elected officials are sitting down with the executive branch and deciding, as a matter of public policy, airlines are not simply uh, mom and pop. They are very, very important to the future of the country. That's what drove the 9-11 fund, as Andrew Sorkin knows very well. The 9-11 Victim Compensation well, Fund uh, was a result of the airlines recognizing they need help uh, against potential lawsuits. Right. Well, let me ask you this, though. As a matter of public policy over the past decade and specifically over the past several years, uh, corporations in America have lobbied very aggressively for lower taxes, uh, to pay less in taxes. Uh, the wealthiest in this country have lobbied very aggressively, successfully to have a lower tax rate. And when all is said and done and you look at who will ultimately be the beneficiary of the, the, the savings that are going to take place here, uh, or all of the companies that are going to take place here, are the people who are paying less than they would have otherwise. Do you think that's going to change the conversation in America when this is all over? We'll see in November of 2020, I'll tell you that. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like this. This is an asterisk, like the 9-11 attacks were unique. I think what we're going through right now is a very, very, is an aberration from the normal public policy discourse. And I think you, you better be careful about drawing too many conclusions from an unprecedented historical situation. Um, but I think the that, simple that, Ken, question, Ken, let me ask you something. One of the, and I apologize for the, the back and forth. We're on a delay here a little bit. But, you know, you could look at all of the things that have happened over the past 30 or 40 years as aberrations, as idiosyncratic uh, pieces. But if you are trying to plan and have a budget for this country in terms of how much revenue you need, how much you need for a rainy Just day, for Just better or worse, we now have had 9-11, we've had 2008, we've had uh, 
uh, now 2020 in this pandemic, it seems that every 10 years we have some type of, of, of disaster that requires some kind of major infusion of capital from this country. And we seem to be underprepared because even in the best of times, we spend more than we even have. Well, I think that uh, you can make a very strong argument, as you have in your question or statement, that uh, we are not well prepared. We don't anticipate tragedies like this. I'm not sure you can anticipate a, a coronavirus tragedy like this, but I do agree with the thrust of your question that that we ought to be better prepared for these global um, um, tragedies that impact every American citizen and every world citizen, frankly. Um, one of the other questions is what kind of restrictions um, or other types of terms you think should potentially be on these bailouts, not just for the airlines, but potentially across this country. One of the things that's happening is uh, we are obviously uh, putting a lot of money into uh, the economy, by the way, which I think is absolutely necessary. I want to be 100 percent clear. It's absolutely necessary to do these things now in the moment. The question is, you look at the airlines, for example, and come September 30th, if there's not demand uh, for their services, they're very much allowed to start to lay off employees. And so the question is, how much does that really buy you? Oh, I think that's a very, very good question. There's two answers to your, your, to your question. First, making sure that the legislation and the regulations that accompany these bailouts very specifically uh, uh, constrain the airlines or any other beneficiary so that the Congress is getting what it intends in the way of protection for individual employees, etc. Secondly, I've learned from experience, you better have somebody <clears throat> who's administering these various programs, <clears throat> excuse me, administering these programs, independent, very competent, a bipartisan, credible individual where nobody will question any of the political motivations or the rationale behind these bailouts. Uh, substance is one thing. Process, getting the money out fast in a way that everybody thinks is credible and apolitical, very, very important. That's why Senator Schumer— So the government Schumer, be trying to make money— I'm sorry, go yeah. ahead. That's why no, Senator— I was going to say— uh, Go ahead. That's why Senator Schumer, for one, I know, was very concerned about making sure that how this, how the administration rolls out these programs in a competent, apolitical way uh, was a very important, a very important objective uh, of his. Right. You want the job to oversee this thing? There are thousands of people that can do this job. This is not rocket science. You've got to just brace yourself. Follow the statute, follow the regulations, do what's right. And very, very important, I've learned personally, very credible, you have to be apolitical. This is a, a public policy assignment that requires credibility, competence, and a sense among the American people that it's being administered in a very fair and equitable way.